Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue gleaning the fields uh, from Daniel chapter 11. And uh, we're looking at, uh, we're going to start looking at verses 19 to 22, a little bit more detail. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the time that we have this morning. And I'm thankful for the warm house I have to live in, uh, with the cold outside. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that we can live in your presence, that we can experience your warmth and the fellowship uh, that we can have with one another through thy spirit. We pray, Lord, uh, for each person searching for truth. We ask that you can guide them and direct them in their individual study. And we ask for your angels' care and protection uh, for those um, that, that are for our families, uh, for those studying. And um, we ask, Lord, that through your spirit, you can be here, and that you can direct and guide us. Thank you for the light that you've been giving us. May we walk in that light by thy strength and power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, here it's uh, it's getting pretty cold outside. We're going to have uh, it's only going to be what, minus, I say, minus fifty one Fahrenheit tomorrow night, something like that. You know, minus fifty one Fahrenheit tomorrow, tomorrow night. So, so and then. Uh, minus 49 Fahrenheit the next night. So that's like 46 and 45. So if you think of it that way, if you're American, it doesn't seem as cold. But um, anyway, we're, we're studying here Daniel chapter 11. And one of the main things that we have run into is that in Daniel chapter 11, we see that God God's providence is being directed in these events and it wasn't something that we were looking for it just was the result of of studying what the language was so we had we had noticed this first back in verse 14 um you know when we're dealing with going way back here um where was this okay Yes, so um, <clears throat> when it says uh, the breakers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. And that just seemed kind of like odd language to me. That, you know, obviously this is a fulfillment of prophecy and God is directing the papacy to exalt themselves. And, and we're familiar with this. The papacy exalts itself to establish the vision. But they don't do that of their own accord. That is, they're not thinking we're exalting our, ourselves to establish the vision of Daniel or the, the chazon, right? So Daniel uh, chapter 8 is where we normally think about the chazon there, right? Um, which really is the, two, the 2520, right? So the, especially... Uh, considering these two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. So, so we first noticed it there. As we were looking at these verses, uh, we ran again into uh, seeing that there was something that was uh, an action that um, that appeared to be God's action. Thus shall he do. So this is in in verse sixteen. I believe that's in verse sixteen. Right, verse 17, maybe. Yeah, verse 17, where it says, Thus ha shall he do. And, and, and so we say, God hath appointed by his providence. That's, that's how we took, uh, that, that, that action is God's providence. And, and then it says, um, he shall give him the daughter of women. And as we looked at it, this, this really goes back to Genesis. This is the idea that, you know, 
the man and the woman, they shall leave their, you know, their father and mother, they join each other, they become one flesh, right? So there's this idea of marriage. But here we see it symbolically portrayed in this um this woman and and this corrupts her. So the question was, well, who was the he? And we decided that that was God. That God is the one who is giving Cleopatra to uh, Julius Caesar, thus corrupting her, right? So this is not in a, a relationship that's really a marriage. And, and this causes her ruin. Now, Cleopatra, queen of Egypt, she represents the world. So her ruin is the fall of the world. Now, the, the world in the sense here of um, of Egypt is this idea of the world like the United Nations. So we could have put the United Nations there, but this is really the, the whole world, right? So, so the idea here is that we have this intervention of God, right? So God's providence is working. So we see God stepping into this history. So this was the second place that we really noticed it. And and if we think back to Daniel chapter 10, of course, this great controversy that's going on, that this is being acted out or in, enacted. So we see Rome rising, right, exalting itself to establish the vision. And um, we then see this uh, overcoming of Egypt. Now, Egypt represents atheistic communism. So, so there's some interesting things that, that came out of that as we started to continue to go through this. Then we finally came to, um, I, I think probably the most controversial interpretation here would be, but a prince uh, shall cause the reproach to cease, right? Now, in the Hebrew, I spent a lot of time looking at the Hebrew. And when we look at the translation in the King James, but the but a prince for his own behalf shall cause reproach, reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach. Um, he shall cause it to turn upon him, upon him. Right. And, and this, this was not really supported by the Hebrew, all of these extra words. Um, and you can see it's, it's really, you got the word prince, which isn't the first word. The first word is seven, six, seven, three, which is, uh, to cease, and then it has the word prince, and then it has the word reproach, right? So that's that first phrase. Nothing in the Hebrew forms of the word, which would say for his own behalf, shall cause uh, the reproach offered by him, especially is not there, to cease, right? But if we just took those out and we looked at it, but a prince... And we put that as Michael, your prince, shall cause the reproach to cease. We could see that this would introduce the cross. And it says, uh, without his own reproach, that is, he doesn't have his own reproach, his own shame. He shall cause it to turn upon himself. Right? So Christ takes the reproach, the shame upon him. And then the question was, well, why would this be introduced here? It at the time of Julius Caesar. And, and my suggestion is that, well, this is this whole situation dealing with the siege of Alexandria um, and, and the events that follow. So he's going to be given Cleopatra. That's when he's in Alexandria. When he leaves Alexandria and he goes to Rome, he's going to receive all of these honors. And he's basically wanting to be a king. He has a throne. He has all of these these trappings of being a king doesn't have the crown, which is something he would like. But what we see is a contrast first to Julius Caesar's attitude and Christ's attitude. So they're quite different. Um, but also this is at a time when Caesar is seeking to take uh, this whole area, because remember that this is um, in this this part here. <laughs> he turns his face unto the isles. So he's seeking to take over the world. All these peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Right? And um, 
And, and so it's at this time that we are introduced with the cross. And this makes sense because what's going to follow then is uh, the end of Julius Caesar, uh, the rise of Caesar Augustus, and then Tiberius Caesar. And it's going to be under Caesar Augustus that Christ is going to be born. And it's going to be under Tiberius Caesar that Christ is going to be crucified. And so this makes sense. Right. And especially going to refer to the Prince of the Covenant, crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD at the end of verse 22. And, and then I suggested that this section that ends with the cross, then when we go to verse 23, it's going to go back over this history. And, it, and it's going to deal with the Jewish League. So this Jewish League um, is, this is the next section, but that section is going to be addressing something different. Right? So it, it's going to be covering the same history, but it, from a different perspective. And this is contrary to how many people read Daniel chapter 11, where they're going to still be reading Antiochus Epiphanes in this history. And, and then, you know, verse 23 is just going to follow from that history dealing with the Antiochus Epiphanes, right? So, so our view, the Adventist view in where we, uh, we see here Julius Caesar, not Antiochus Epiphanes is, is different, but our view we're, we're, we're looking pretty much close to the pioneer view. Um, but we have some added detail. And the other thing, of course, is we make an application of this to our time, which, which obviously is important that we understand the historical application correctly. Now, I don't know how comfortable people are with, with this interpretation that we have of these verses. Uh, but this is just to me seems to be um, what, what we've come up with. It's it just seems to be where it's it, we've been led. I mean, it's not something we were looking for. We're not looking for a novel interpretation of these verses. We're just trying to understand them. And so I think we did find something that other people hadn't noticed before. But it, it doesn't essentially change our historical application of these verses, right? Like of, of what's the main topic. And this, this would be understood by Jeff as well. You know, when we go up to Daniel, um, when we go up to verse 22, that's going to bring us up to the crucifixion of Christ. And then verse 23 is going to go back to this Jewishly. So, so that part of it is, is still intact. Okay, so hopefully that was a good review. A any thoughts about what well, this review, what we've been covering so far? Just fairly straightforward so far, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think so. It's, but it is kind of surprising what we have noticed. So I, I hope people are happy with it. You know, I mean, not everybody's here. A lot of people watch, and I haven't had a lot of. I haven't had any real negative comments about uh, the interpretation, especially of verse 18, referring to the cross. Um, so, you know, now what we want to do is we want to add some of these applications to our time. And, and I want to go back here a little bit. So one of the things that we had done when we were looking at... Um, uh, where is it here? Just going back to so verse 14. Um, the choices of the people. I'm just reading over this again. Yeah, I think we added quite a bit in here. Um, yeah, I think we filled that in pretty good. Um, so now what we would have in this part where it introduces the cross. Um, how would this apply to this movement at the present time? Because uh, where is the cross as a way mark? And, and we still have to draw some of this stuff out on the line, which we haven't done, but we will get there. So, so we have the cross introduced here. 
But the cross is not the cross yet, because it's not going to be till verse 22 that we actually get to the cross, but it's introduced here. So why is it introduced here? And what would that have to do with our lives? I mean, where do we put put this in our lives? Because remember, we're after 2001, right? Um, we're dealing with in um, this conquering of the papacy of of Egypt. And so we're saying that that is something uh, that has happened. And and how are we understanding this occupation of Egypt? So we have the occupation would the occupation of Egypt be comparable to the acceptance of wokeism? Okay, right. So that's what we're saying. So there's and that seems kind of weird because we would think, well, isn't that Egypt conquering the papacy? But the papacy conquers wokeism by gaining the favor of wokeism, right? Okay. Um, we saw this with Parminder and Tess. Do they think that Pope Francis is a good pope? Yes. Yeah. So, so we can see that we have in 2001, the United States is conquered by, by the papacy, right? That's where we, we have this spiritual formation and everything. So we see that. But what we say is after this, um, which is the occupation of Egypt. So you have to have that first. Then the papacy shall turn his face unto the isles. So this is dealing with that gathering of the forces for the Sunday law. Right. So so we're going to see that in some way the papacy is going to be not <coughs> in control of the UN, but it, it's going to have a stronger influence in what is happening. Now, now this is getting up to the Sunday law, right? So when we look at this, this, this is talking about the Sunday law, but the Sunday law is not going to be till verse 22. So he's going to take away many. And then they introduce Michael, your prince. So Michael, your prince in... And, and here I have it as Michael, your prince in red. I should have that in black because that's, oops, black. So I don't know why I have it in red. So, so Michael, your prince is introducing something in our time. And so what would Michael, the prince, Michael, your prince, be representing in our time? Think back to chapter 10. Because his name means one who is like God. So this must refer to the 144,000. Does that make sense to people? I think we need to, to really take this. I mean, we've, we've talked about putting this to a line. Yeah. This is going to take some further consideration. Yeah. And I mean, in my mind, I'm drawing it on a line, right? So I'm looking at what's happening. Now, we're going to have some more specific things once we address it as a line as far as dates. Um, but here we have this 144,000 because they're the ones who are like God, right? That is, they re reveal Christ's character. And this is an issue within the great controversy because in the great controversy, you need this people that are going to represent Christ. They're going to represent, they're going to be the ones, so they're introduced here, right? This is not, this is not the issue of the Sunday law yet. So, but there is this reproach and we can simply look at this reproach and we can say that this is July 18, 2020 in, in our line, right? So what we're going to do is, I'm going to put this in red. So I didn't really put anything there. But we know what the reproach is. This is the sit. And so that we're saying that July 18, 2020 represents this. And this word to cease, here we have this word 7673. And, and we're saying that that word, which is the Sabbath, 
probably could put it here on the other side. So I'll put it like this. I'll just put it like this, Shabbat. So I put it this way with, with the one B, right? Because it's it's just the word that means to rest. It's not really the word the Sabbath, right? But it's that's that's what's it's introducing the cross here. And um so this has to be something that in our history parallels this, right? So we can just say, you know, this is about the Sabbath Sunday test, all these different things. Uh, but the simple thing is uh, the third angel's message. Okay, so you got the third angel's message. And that's something that in our history uh, comes with July 18, 2020, right? So this is bringing us to July 18, 2020 and the aftermath, right? And, and we use that, you know, the 2781 because that's 1872. That's the symbol for July 18, 2020. Now it says, without his own reproach, since Christ has no shame of his own, he shall cause it to turn upon himself. Now, if we're going to make an application here, um, this is just foreshadowing what's going to happen. This is foreshadowing basically the sun, Sunday law. Now, now, obviously, in this reference to Christ, we're not making, we don't say that we have no shame, right? But, of course, that's going to be removed. And so this this is, is talking about what's going to happen later, right? So we'll just leave that for now. Okay, so so we'll leave this, this part, and we'll, we'll come back to this to see if this, uh, these symbols uh, bear out, if they, they fit once we start drawing these on the line. But now we're going to see the, what the papacy is do, doing. So the papacy shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. And, and so we're trying to understand how this happened. So this part was rather difficult when we started looking at it. And, and we still have to sort through some of these things. So we see we got Caesar Augustus is going to follow Julius Caesar. Now, prior to that, there is uh, the first triumvirate, right? So we're going to have, uh, what's his name, Lepidus, um, Octavius, Octavian, whatever his name is who later becomes Augustus and uh, Mark Antony, right? So you're going to have those three. But what's going to end up happening? So the Bible doesn't here, it doesn't address all of that in this section, right? It's, it's going to address it a bit later, but in this section, it doesn't. It just gives these presidents of the United States, right? So it's going to give us... Uh, Julius Caesar. And the thing is, we have Julius Caesar as the papacy. We have to say, well, how does that work? If we're now going to say that Augustus is Obama and Tiberius is Trump, right? So, so that's kind of where we, we finished yesterday. So when we're dealing with Julius Caesar, turning his face toward the fort of his own land, is there some other way in which we could bring this not to be the papacy or should it stay as the papacy? Right. So this we haven't decided. And he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So this is going to be Julius Caesar's assassination on March 15, 44 BC. Um, and then in his estate, that is in Caesar's estate, a razor of ra then shall stand up a razor of taxes in the glory of his of the kingdom. So at this point, this is going to be the height of Rome under Augustus. And, and then he's going to die peacefully in his bed in AD 14, right? And then then Tiberius is going to come, and that's going to be you know. The Rome reaches its height 
is going to be involved in the crucifixion of Christ shortly after. And, and ultimately it will fall apart, right? It's there for a long time, but you know, the, the seeds of its downfall have been planted right from the beginning. Um, so how it got to the point that it, it did is the reason for its downfall. But anyway, so let's address this point. So Julius Caesar here, we've had representing the papacy. Now, Julius Caesar represents Rome. And under Julius Caesar, uh, do we still have the Roman Republic? Under Caesar, do we have a Roman Republic? No. Under Julius Caesar? No. Okay, what do we have? How is, it, how, how is it operated now? What would we call that? We would have a dictatorship. Okay, so you have a dictator. Okay. And then... And What's the difference then with Augustus? I mean, he's called an emperor. How is Julius Caesar being a dictator different? Now, I mean, they still have the Senate and all those different types of things, um, you know, even through this history. They just lose more and more of their power. But how, how do we describe this history? Now, was he officially proclaimed dictator? No, he just took on the mantle. They... They had said that they wanted him for a while as a dictator, and then he took the mantle of dictator. So they did at some point make him dictator, because dictator is a position that's part of the Roman government. In in certain times, in order to be more efficient, they can make someone dictate. When they, they make- when they think that there is a time of ex- extreme trouble, they would make right. one into a dictator. Right. Did they do that with Julius Caesar is the question I have. I, I, I didn't find that in the reading that I had. I mean, he oh, was right. constantly different things. Okay. But anyway, he's, he's, he's still under a Roman Republic, even as a dictator to some degree. Right. You know, the question is trying to understand the change that happens here in this story, because there is a change in Rome. Now, um, you know, so we we've just continued to put this as Rome, but we know that the armies of Rome are the United States, right? That is the power that supports Rome. Now he's going to conquer um, Seleucid Syria, so the papacy con- uh, conquers Seleucid Syria, which is going to represent the United States in this case. Um, so he conquers the king of the north, the USA, and, and thus it becomes the king of the north in, in, in the process. So pagan Rome conquers Seleucid Syria, the papacy conquers the US. And now we know that in, in doing that, because when we dealt with this, pagan Rome cometh against him, the USA shall do according to his own will. Um, we're going to put that as December 25th, 1991. That's going to be the end of that, of the Soviet Union. So in conquering the Soviet Union, the United States is also conquering the United States. So it, the pagan Rome becomes the king of the north. The papacy becomes the king of the north, but it still has, uh, the armies of the United States. Now, in that history, we're going to have the New World Order speeches under George Bush the first, and the first one being 9-11-90. So he paid in Rome under Pompey the Great. Now, we're going to say, well, this is the papacy, right? So you're going to have Pompey the Great. So this is earlier. She'll stand in the glorious land, right? So he's going to go and conquer uh, uh, Judea, Palestine. Right. And which by his hand, the message to the Levites is how we apply that March 27th uh, symbol shall be consumed. And that's going to be the, the siege of 63 B.C. So we have these symbols there that uh, came from that. So um, and this was counting. We came to this November 19th, 2019. Um, probably should have a footnote in there, but. We'll, we'll come back to that again. Some of this stuff I'm going to have, when we start drawing this out on a line, we're going to deal with some of that. I think it's the 3615 
I know we have some stuff dealing with that number. I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, cause we have, we connect the two Bushes from the Gulf War ending in February 28th, 1991 to Bush, the two's inauguration on January 20th. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so we get to that point. So that's under, uh, Pompey. And then we have pagan Rome under Julius Caesar. So again, we're just saying that that's the papacy because it's just Rome. And he's going to set his face to enter Egypt, atheist to communism, with the strength of his whole kingdom, all Caesar's military resources, and the upright ones, the Jews with him, uh, that's the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. And we connect that to the Protestants in spiritual formation. So it's going to bring us, uh, as we go through this, um, the spiritual formation, we know that's going to be at 9-11. And um, then we have, okay, so I'm just trying to see. So when we get here then, and we get to Julius Caesar being the papacy, <clears throat> we would have to say, how does Julius Caesar's death, how does that figure in this history, in our history. And especially if we're going to say that in his estate, there's going to stand up a raiser of taxes, which would be Obama. So is there some way that we could look at Julius Caesar as more than just the papacy in this section? Because the papacy is united with uh, the United States. So that's where we're having this problem. Okay. So we're past 9-11, right? Now 9-11 is connected as a symbol to 11-9, right? Um, so there's some things there dealing with 9-11 about the, the symbols of the Sunday law. So this is a typical history. So can we make here in verse 19... Can the papacy be something else? Or can Julius Caesar be something else other than the papacy? Can we put this as, I mean, and the question has to be, when we're looking at um, Reagan, Bush the first, uh, Clinton, and Bush the second, is there a different relationship with the papacy in that history than when Obama comes to power? I believe there was. Okay. So is, is Obama that concerned about doing the dictates of the Pope? Is he that concerned about his alliance with the papacy? Or is he no. distancing himself from that? No, he's not. He's more, he's more concerned. He's more concerned with his relationship with Islam. Okay. So, so there's a change that happens with Obama. Okay. So if we're going to talk about Julius Caesar or he, right, in this history, I mean, we know it's going to be Julius Caesar, right? But um, this is... Uh, Maybe we could call it, and I don't know that you could see this here, but a, a U.S. papal alliance is in this history. <laughs> Does that make sense? Or not? That's just a suggestion. I'm just putting it in there. I would have to consider it. I was looking at several things that you'd asked before. Yeah. Well, do you have any any other things that you you want to? Well, one of the points that I don't believe is is covered in current studies is that under in the Roman Republic, a dictator was generally appointed. Yeah. Yeah. He was appointed. I know. Now several times the same person was appointed as dictator. 
Not dictated for life, just temporary. They have a term. That's correct. And usually it's for a specific reason that a dictator is appointed. In the history of the Roman Republic, they began appointing dictators in the in the fifth and sixth centuries BC. It's kind of interesting that the, the first one noted in history is appointed in the 253rd year after the founding of Rome. 253rd, you said? 253rd year after the founding of Rome, which would have been... It all counts, so 252 years after. No, I'm saying... You gave an order on the thing, third. I'm I'm using it because that's the the record that I'm looking at. Right. So if it's 253rd, that means 252 years after the founding of Rome. Because you'd have the first year of the founding of Rome is the year that Rome is founded. Okay. You don't have a year, right? Okay. Okay. That, that's all I'm saying. Is if you if you say if you use an order of count, that assumes you're not having a zero. So if you count with a zero, it's going to be one less. Okay. Now, it's just an observation there. With this, with this observation as well, that would have been approximately 501 BC. Okay. So, fifth and sixth centuries, they were appointing dictators. In the fourth century, they appointed dictators. In fact, they had one dictator that, that they liked so much. Five times he was appointed dictator of Rome, but never as dictator for life. Yeah. You come down into the third century BC, and there were there were several dictators appointed here. There were no dictators are that were recorded in the second century BC, but we come to the first century BC and Five times dictators were appointed. Four of those times, it was Caesar. The final time that he was appointed dictator was in 44 BC or 710, the 710th year after the founding of Rome. Okay. Yeah. So that's going to be just before they kill him. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because I know they confer all kinds of honors upon you. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> now, what's what's interesting is the Magister Equatium was another position that they would appoint whenever they would they would have a person appointed as as dictator. Now. When we're looking at, at a term like this in the, in the um, Latin, the magister equatum is the English master of the horse or master of the cavalry. And this is someone that's appointed as a lieutenant to the dictator. I find it interesting that twice the magister equatum appointed was Marcus Amelius Lepidus, who was one of the founders of the second triumvirate. Mm -hmm. He's so in, the first. Yeah, so that's the second triumvirate? I always get these confused. So you have okay. the first triumvirate is which? The first triumvirate that we speak of is Caesar, Pompey. Oh, Pompey, right. That's the one. Okay. All right. Yeah. And Caesar, Pompey, and? Just a second. I had it in my mind, but Crassius. Okay, Crassius. And then the okay. second one is uh, Octavia. Um, the second one is Lepidus, Octavian. Octavian, and Mark Antony. Mark Antony. Okay. Okay, so those triumvirates. Um, 
Okay, so this first one, this is going to be with the... Uh, so this first triumvirate, its purpose, why do they have this triumvirate? Well, this was a kind of a loose political association because you had in Crassius the wealthiest of the men, mm-hmm. and in Caesar and Pompey you had two of the great generals. Yeah. Now there's going to be a civil war dealing with Caesar and Pompey. There's going to be a civil war dealing with with Caesar, yes, because Pompey, by the time we get down to all of this, Pompey would have long passed from the stage because he was beheaded when he was in, in Syria. Okay, well, there's a civil war. I thought Pompey was the one that Caesar, that the civil war is over Caesar and Pompey taking control of Rome. Well... We haven't really looked at the Civil War. I did watch a documentary. So the the Roman the, the Caesar Civil War yeah. that, that we're talking about had more to do with political tensions relating to Caesar's place in the Republic. Right. But he's fighting against Pompey. Well this yeah, the Civil War takes place between between the years of 49 and 45 BC. Yeah, so it's during the late Roman Republic. You got two factions, Gaius Julius Caesar and how do you say his name? Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Was what Pompey Pompeius Magnus, right? Um, so it's after Caesar had won the the invasion of Gaul. He invaded it for 10 years, right? Correct. So tensions between them and so that that's going to be so that's the civil war i know about which we haven't really spent too much time on um so it's going to go from the 10th of january 49 bc to the 17th of march in 45 bc so you're looking at just slightly more than uh, four years that you have the civil war going on right so that's going to um uh, yeah, so, um, there's a lot on this here in Wikipedia of what ended up happening. So, so it's going to deal with Egypt as well, this, and and then you're going to have the siege of Alexandria. That's all connected to it. Um, then you're going to have the war against the Pharnacuses, Pharnaces, however you say his name. Um, and then you're gonna. It's gonna end in well, all these different things that Caesar is doing. It's gonna be after this return, of course, that then Caesar is gonna get all these triumphs. And, um, and since they had a civil war, I mean, he has a triumph for you know this is like a parade um, for defeating you know defeating Pompey. And of course, you know, that's Romans against Romans. So this becomes quite dis- distasteful to people. And then he's going to be assassinated, right? So, so that civil war there, I think we have to somehow address that in a little more detail. Um, I think we're going to have to look at it in, in a little bit more than a little detail because, I mean, in this, in this situation, if, if we're going to look at the, Civil War of Caesar that went from 49 to 45 BC. Mm-hmm. The death of Pompey occurs in 48 BC. Yeah. So, um, but he, yeah. Okay. So it doesn't make sense to me because you still have the Pompeian forces, even if he's dead. Correct. So they're just, so it's just a faction. They, they support Pompey even though he's dead. Correct. Seems kind of- well, okay. okay. Let, let, let's let's take this in a, in a different way of looking at. It. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What if Pompey is equated with Trump? What if Caesar is being equated with Biden? 
Uh, okay. Well, no. So, so the first thing is we're not there yet, and that's not going to make this work. I mean, we'd have to rethink all of this. Um, all I'm doing is looking at the fact that the Pompeian forces continue this war for several years after Pompey's death. Yeah, there still could be other things that we could apply it to. Okay. So, all I'm saying is that you've asked for you've asked questions. Yeah. How else do you apply it? It's a good question. You know, it's a good comment. I'm just saying why I think it, it doesn't work, because we'd have to rethink all of this if, if we did that. So that's why I say no. doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong or anything, or that the idea is wrong. Um, now, I mean, we have other things that are dead. You know, so one is the Soviet Union is dead. But, you know, this is dealing with a civil war. And, and we've already looked at a civil war that deals with a civil war within the United States. Right? So. Right. But, but here we're dealing, we're dealing with an earlier history at this point. And this is going to give a sketchier history when we go over it once we get to verse 23 and we go through the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. We're going to have, we're going to go over some of the same history again. Right? So, and, and especially dealing with Augustus. So, so we have to, we have to sort that, sort through that. And you know, it's tough people watching on. Hi, Stephen. Um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, figure out what's happening because we don't know necessarily what's happening at this point. So we're trying to sort this through. So any comments that people have, you know, are obviously, open for discussion but um so when we go back here so we have if, if we're going to try to do something like that we would have to move this to a later history these preceding verses right and and i think that this seems pretty solid where we have placed this so it's it's bringing up us up to this typical line and Part of what I understand about this history is that this is bringing us into this history that deals with Trump, right? Because Trump is going to be Tiberius Caesar. That's something that we had established, that Jeff had established. The Tiberius represents Trump. And, and so that brings us into this history of our line up to a point, right? And, and I believe it's a typical line, right? That is the typical line dealing with the prediction regarding July 18, 2020, and the prediction regarding Trump. And what I think is when we get to verse 18, it addresses everything dealing with July 18 and its typical significance in raising up this message, the third angel's message, within this movement. Then when we go to uh, verse 19 to 22, it's going to be addressing these presidents of the United States. And so I'm just saying that Julius Caesar here would represent the United States in this period of the papal alliance from, you know, you could probably, you know, just start with, you know, Reagan maybe, but but it's definitely in that history because before Obama, remember we connected Bush the second with Bush the first. And so when Obama comes, it, it's a change that happens, right? That is, it becomes an empire. Now there's going to be uh, the second um, uh, triumvirate in there that's going to lead then to Augustus becoming the emperor. So that's going to be the one with, um, uh, I can't remember now. I thought I could remember all these. So that's going to be Lepidus, uh, Mark Anthony, and Augustus, right? Or Octavian. So they, they're, they're going to be the ones in that term. Right? But it's going to lead to Augustus becoming this emperor, right? 
So, so there's a bunch of words we have to look at, a bunch of, uh, of symbols that are here that is going to help us. But I think that that's the best way to look at Julius Caesar in that verse, in verse 19, is that this represents the United States under that papal alliance. Now, then it says he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. And then we would have to figure out what that means. Right. Now, historically, that's going to be Julius Caesar going back to Rome. And and there he's going to be assassinated. Right. So. How would we then um, if, if this is the case, if this historical application is correct, how would we then apply that to our history? Now, does is it referring to uh, this U.S. papal alliance that somehow stumbles and falls and is not found? You know, so Caesar's assassination becomes a problem. Now, you were trying to say that if we put uh, Julius Caesar here as as Trump, right? That's what you were trying to say. No, I was I was looking more at Pompey. Okay, Pompey is Trump. Okay, so but where do we see Pompey here? Because it's going to be Julius Caesar that's assassinated. I recognize that Julius Caesar is going to be assassinated, but so was Pompey. Yeah, but he's not mentioned here. Okay, we are still looking at this through the lens of both Smith and um, swearing it. Well, yeah. Okay. Go on. All I'm asking is, is there a a different way of looking at this? You're saying that this... Wouldn't be Julius Caesar turning his face toward the port of his own land and his assassination. Okay. Caesar would be, yes. So I'm just, I'm having to ask other questions just to make sure that everything that we're approaching on this, on this entire verse is correct in its application. Yeah. Yeah, and we do. I mean, when we look at these things, we know we have something that's been given to us. We we have this heritage of understanding these verses, um, both in Millerite history, in, in Adventist history, and in this movement. Right. So every time we examine these, we see that, you know, we're generally correct. There are details that we miss. Um, but, you know, we're not we're not departing from the basic framework that's here. But if we were to say that this isn't Julius Caesar that's being referred to it was somebody else, I don't see how it could apply. Um, and especially when you say, then she'll stand up in his estate and raise her taxes. Well, this de- definitely brings us to Augustus. Right. And then the next one is going to be Tiberius. And that's where we're going to see the um, the Prince of the Covenant, right, being executed. Right? His crucifixion. And, and so we have the arms of the flood, a symbol that symbolizes the Sunday law, which, of course, is connected also to. Um, you know, to what what happens. Uh, to Christ. Right. So the so the Prince of the Covenant, the crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD. So. So I think this has to be, you know, the basic historical application would have to be correct. Yeah, I think. uh, Yes. Yeah, I agree. That's that's a good link with uh, Augustus Caesar, the raiser of taxes. Taxes. I can't see anything else sort of Mm -hmm. fitting in with that. Uh, yeah, especially from a biblical point of view, just from the fulfillment of the prophecy dealing with the crucifixion of Christ and so forth and his birth and all that. Yeah. Okay, go on. 
Uh, just with the March 15 aspect, if we uh, connect that maybe to a 153? Yeah. Yeah, Angela noted that in one of her comments on uh, Facebook. Yeah. The 153. Yeah. And uh, maybe linking that to like a 1533 or something, maybe? Okay. Um, we have a 153 in 1844, and here we have a March 15 in 44 BC. You know, with okay. the sign of the snow, you have 153 in 1844, maybe something there. Yeah, so you said 1533 years? Well, maybe you could relate that as well, but you had a 153 in 1844 with Samuel Snow's letters. Yeah. So you have a 44 and 153 link. Yeah, but 1533 years, you said. Or even days, or just the 1533. Okay, I just was wondering maybe if you were connecting somewhere 1533 years, uh, you know, in some way in these lines. Uh, I haven't thought of that. Okay. Okay, so. Hmm. And then yeah. if, we, uh, if, if we add, uh, so this would be 1888 years, inclusive count. To 1844 as well. So you just add from 44 BC to 1844 is 1888. Okay, you're saying from 44 BC to 1844 is 1888. Yeah, okay. So it gives you that symbol. Connecting. Yes. Okay. So what was so yeah. So maybe like the assassination of the Jones and Wagner message, the Third Angel's message, maybe. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. Now we connect 1888 uh, to our history as well. So maybe there's something in there that we would have to look at. Something I have to think about. Um, yeah, so... So one is we, we don't see Pompey referred to here in in this. Like we don't have the triumvirates, the tri at least uh, uh, the first triumvirate or the second I don't, in this section at all. Um, but the idea that if if we say it's Julius Caesar, right, which which I think we have to, but he turns his face toward the fort of his own land. The question is, what is that symbolizing in our history? Now, if it's this U.S. Papal Alliance, is there something about that turning their face toward the fort of their own land? Now, the idea of these words here, so we know historically what happens, at least we believe that we do. So, you know, a fort here is just simply... Um, my computer's slow. It refers to strength or fortress. So we looked at its ma'az, right? And that word shows up lots of different places. We run into it at other times. Um, it's, uh, and then we ran into it <coughs> in Ezekiel. And there's there's related words that we've run into as well. So I'm trying to think where that was. Well, we ran into it in Daniel 11, verse 7. It's also translated as fortress and in verse 10. And so the idea here, when we looked at fortress, we were discussing um, that it's a place of refuge, a stronghold. Okay. Now, um, in it, the related word is uh, in Strong's number is five eight one zero, which means to be stout. So, <clears throat> so, so somehow here, when we look at this this verse, that he shall turn his face. Now, this word turn shub, right? 
uh, we've run into lots, lots of times. It means return or turn. And then his face, panim, right? So that's a really common word. It talks about the face of the ground, you know, it's, it's sometimes translated as presence. And then, um, it's ma'az and then land, right? And it's 776. So we got, um, We have seven seven two five plus six four four zero plus four five eight one plus seven seven six. Now this gives us uh, nineteen thousand five hundred and twenty two. Now I've looked at this a number of times trying to figure this out. Now um, it's eight hundred and two days longer than one eight seven two zero, and you know, there could be some date that we start this at in in our history that could help us. But um, um, let me see here. So it's a period of 53 years and three, yeah, 53 years and 164 days, 163.7. So... Um, I don't know what to do with that. Um, so I'm not sure what that, if, if we just took those numbers and used them as a symbol, what we could do with that. Now, um, it is, now, so when we deal with his, the 776, right? So the 776, that's the number of days from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991, right? Um, now, I added that to that number. So that's, but if I subtracted that, I'm going to have 18,746. So I'm going to have an extra 26 days uh, to, um, to that symbol of 18720. So I don't know. That means anything. But if I just took, you know, turn his face toward the fort, and I didn't put his own land in there, I have 18,746. So I don't know what that would mean. We have a symbol of July 18th with a symbol 46. Maybe. <clears throat> and that would give you, I don't know why. Right. So, I mean, it gives you a symbol that connects to the, you know, time of the end to October 22nd, 46 years. Okay. So, so Stephen did a calculation. So when Caesar is crucified in 44 and when Christ is no longer found in the holy place, it's 1887 years, seven months and seven days. So it's, it's not 1888 years. It's 1887 years, seven months, and seven days. So, so there is a connection then to October 22nd. Yeah, you have, uh, well, Christ, well, sorry, Caesar wasn't crucified. He was assassinated. And he was yeah. assassinated. He had 23 stab wounds. Okay. And then 20, you have uh, October 22nd, the end of the 2300 day, years. As well, yeah. so you have a 23 connection. Okay, so then could I take when he turns his face towards the fort, and I took that number 18746. I have the 187th day of the year is October 22nd in 1844. It's 46 years after the time of the end, right? And and then we have so we have a parallel then that ties in um, the death of Julius Caesar in this period of time that ties us into these symbols connected with Christ, both with his crucifixion with the two sevens, right? And then also with what happens um, when Christ is not found in the holy place, right? That's what you're saying. So we have all of these symbols that point to that. 
Now that points to our history as well, right? Because we have July 18, 2020, which is going to parallel that history, not just July 18, but the 777 days. So, so I think those are all valid observations. Just exactly. So, so Julius Caesar, he turns his face towards the fort of his own land. And we can connect that to Millerite history. And so what's the parallel here? Who is turning his face toward the fort of his own land in our history? And then after he does that, then Obama becomes uh, the president, right? Because that's how we've understood these these uh, kings or the emperor, you know, that Augustus is going to represent Obama <coughs> and Tiberius represent Trump, unless we have to put some other application there. So I think that's, you know, some interesting ideas that we're still not really solid on who he is. I just said it's the U.S. Papal Alliance. That's just, you know, a guess. You know, how do we understand who Julius Caesar represents in our history? Well, how we lined them up with uh, George Bush, too. Okay, so George Is Bush he... the second. Yeah, because that's before Obama, isn't it? So, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I've thought of that just saying, well, here, after this, these events that we see here, dealing with... Uh, Julius Caesar, right? This conquering of atheistic communism. We go back to, um, uh, in this history, you're going to be looking at, you know, way back here. I mean, you're going to have, uh, George Bush senior, his 9-11 speech, right? So you're going to be brought through that history. And then if you go here and you say it's, it's Bush the second, if we're going to have Bush the second being typified by Julius Caesar here rather than the papacy. Um, I know people always make a lot of, about president's connection with the papacy and so forth, but I definitely think that Bush the second has a connection to the papacy that Obama does not have. Right. Obama's woke. Bush the second is not right. Yes. Now we you could say they're all globalists, but they're globalists from a different perspective. Right. Under, you know, what happened with um, Reagan and then Bush the first. And and then we could even say with. Um, Clinton and then Bush the second. I mean, we could say, well, Clinton, you know, he's he has connections with the globalists, you know, to some degree as well. But, but the main emphasis here is the connection with the papacy. With Obama, he's moving away from that. Right? There definitely is a change that happens here. Now, I mean, we could also, um, you know, in, in this history, because it, it's not mentioned here, but we do know that there is the tri triumvirate, right? The that's going to put Augustus uh, into power. So this is going to be the second triumvirate <clears throat> that eventually leads to him being in power. Um, and, and it's not mentioned here, so I don't know how how we address it, because generally what the, the Bible does is it addresses the history that relates. Uh, so we don't always look at the history that's surrounding things. We, we're aware of it. But there's not a direct reference to it. Um, so, so I think anyway that we can put Bush the second here. That Julius Caesar now is not representing the papacy, but this alliance of the papacy with the United States that has has happened in this history. Because what we see is Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, and Rome does conquer the United States. And the way that we look at it is at 9-11, right? So at 
and it's going to be Bush the second who's the president at 9-11, that the United States is really conquered. And that's because of what happens with the Patriot Act. And, and so even though it's not an openly, you know, the papacy has conquered the United States, it has in principle. We changed from common law to Roman law. And, um, but then Obama comes along and, and he's, he's got a different agenda than the previous presidents. So we're going to have these presidents moving away from their connection with the papacy. Definitely you're not going to see Trump, right? So if we put this here, this equals Trump, which is how Jeff understood this. Then we can see Trump definitely doesn't have an alliance with the papacy or the globalists or anybody. Now, when it says he shall come in peaceably, peaceable transference of power from after Augustus's death, um, I don't know how people would feel about that being a peaceful transfer of power. Obtains the kingdom by flatteries. The idea of that was that, um, so Trump does come in with an election. Uh, even though the media hates it, they, they don't really fight against it like they do later. Um, they actually surprise that Trump comes into power. Um, and then, you know, he we, wins, uh, he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. So we would say that this is going to be basically, um, you know, it's a type of deceit that Trump uses. So he, he maneuvers. He's using uh, a type of politics to, to get into, into power. But then it says, and with the arms of the flood, they shall be over, overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So then you'd have to say, well, we can see under Tiberius Caesar that Christ is crucified. The way that we looked at this before is while Trump was going to bring in the Sunday law, right? So that's how Jeff would interpret this. Trump's in power. The arms of the flood are next. That's the Sunday law. And, um, and then, you know, God's people. Um, now here it has alleged seditionists, and I don't know how we would understand this because that's swearing it in there. So we'd have to look at some of the stuff in the bold black and try to sort through that as well. But you can see that in this line, if, if we're going to take this as you know, Bush the second, Obama, Trump, well then just the Sunday law comes under Trump. Now we can say, well, we have a parallel to the Sunday law that occurs under Trump. And that is the history of this movement. So that this isn't really about the actual Sunday law. This becomes a typical history. So then when we go through this history here, um, you're going to go through the same history again. Now you're going to deal with the um, all these alliances that occur and how Rome ends, right? So it's going to go through this history all the way back to the Jewish League, Right. It's going to bring us to um, uh, the conquering of Israel, you know, the land of Israel, of Jerusalem, uh, then the destruction of Jerusalem. So some of this stuff we're going to have to sort through as well, because this is Swearingen's uh, lines, his, his uh, interpretation of this. So we're going to have to go back through this. But you see the problem that we're, we're facing here with these verses that if we're going to be dealing with Trump as this last Caesar that's mentioned in this section, and we're going to come to the crucifixion of Christ under Tiberius, and we have to make a parallel, then it would appear that the Sunday law occurs under Trump, or something that's typical of the Sunday law, right? We had things that are typical of the Sunday law in our history. We looked at the pandemic as typical of the Sunday law. Any further comments on this? 
And so some of the things that are here, you know, for instance, uh, the arms of the flood shall they, the alleged seditionists, be overflowed from before him. Now, um, I mean, we obviously understand um, some of this from Uriah Smith. And so when we look at Uriah Smith, and he's going to deal with, um, and he's usually basically using Thomas Newton. Um, with the arms of the flood shall it be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Thomas Newton presents the following reading of the text as a more accurate, accurate translation of the original. And the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. This signifies a revolution and violence. And in fulfillment, we should look for the arms of Tiberius, the overflowing, the overflowing to be overflown. In other words, for him to suffer a violent death. To show how this was accomplished, we again cite, cite the Encyclopedia Americana. Um, <clears throat> so he says, acting the hypocrite to the last, he disguised his increasing dis- debility as much as he was able, even affecting to join the sports and exercises of the soldiers of his guard. At length, leaving his favorite island, the scene of the most disgusting debaucheries, he stopped at a country house near uh, the promontory of Missium, where in his 16th, where on the 16th of March 37th, he sunk into lethargy in which he appeared dead. And Caligula was preparing with numerous escorts to take possession of the empire when his sudden revival threw them into consternation. This critical instant macro, the Praetorian prefect, caused him to be suffocated with pillows, thus expired the emperor of Tiberius in the 78th year of his age, and the 23rd of his reign, universally execrated. Okay, so if we're going to apply this here uh, in the way that they have done this, the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown from before him um, and shall shall be broken also the prince of the covenant. Um, Doesn't really make sense what they're saying there. and Because when we deal with the arms of the flood, what is the flood symbolizing? The uh, Sunday law. Yeah, so it symbolizes the Sunday law, right? Which, um, you know, so here, this flood must have something more to do with Rome coming against Christ. So in this, his, so we're going to have to spend some time piecing through this. One is getting the historical application correct, because I don't think that this is correct what we have here, and. Um, and then seeing how this applies. So there's still a lot, a lot to sort through in these few verses, these four verses. Okay. Um, yeah, so with Uriah Smith, and then it's just kind of like, well, they mentioned the Prince of the Covenant, Christ's death took place in the reign of Tiberius. But if you're having the death of Tiberius being referred to, and then also, yea, also the Prince of the Covenant, it doesn't really fit to me uh, to have that. So this this can't refer to the death of Tiberius, you know, to to the sedition. So the arms of the flood can't refer to, you know, some kind of seditionists. Now. Now, I think that there are some things here that we have to consider since Christ has already been referenced in verse 18. Um, we would need to understand maybe that there's there's more here relating to Christ as well that we've just applied to these kingdoms. Now, one of the things we know about Hebrew is when we see a he, Right, because it's not a separate word. Like you look at here at eleven verse nineteen. I'll just go here to the Bible program. You know, and you read this verse, he shall turn his face. Well, you know, this is just the word turn. Now it's it's in a form that's showing that it's he that's turning, not a she, right? Because it's it, it has a form masculine or feminine and so forth. And and then same with face, right? Now, what if this he is referring to 
to Christ, he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. But then the he shall stumble and fall is not referring to Christ. Or maybe it is, right? So maybe there's some way in which we haven't understood this verse. I don't know. That's just a suggestion. Is we have to look at things, as, as Dwight pointed out, look at things even if it's not how we originally looked at it. And, and since we already have all these symbols that pointed to Christ, but they pointed to, of course, the death of Julius Caesar. And I'm not saying the death of the Julius Caesar is a type of Christ, but maybe it is. Right. So anyway, we're going to have to end here with all of these questions hanging in the air. But we got a few days to look at them. I'm going to spend some time, as much time as I can, um, studying these things. And I hope that you do, too. And maybe we can come together next week and sort out these four verses. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We have more questions than answers, but we are thankful that um, you've given us this time to study together. And we just pray for your presence to be with us throughout this day. We ask for your care and love and uh, that we can share this with others, that we can care for those around us. Bring us together again according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.